أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلا تدع مع الله إلها آخر فتكون من المعذبين وأنذر عشيرتك الأقربين واخفض جناحك لمن اتبعك من المؤمنين فإن عصوك فقل إني بريء مما تعملون وتوكل على العزيز الرحيم الذي يراك حين تقوم وتقلبك في الساجدين إنه هو السميع العليم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل الله ما وسلم وبارك على نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته مرحبا بكم welcome to all of you in another lesson <coughs> looking at the character and the traits of our Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and today we are looking at the character trait of humility to be humble the verse I just recited Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَخْفِضْ جَنَاحَكَ لِمَنِ اتَّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Lower your wings for the believers who follow you. <clears throat> what does it mean to lower your wings? Just imagine a bird, an eagle, that terrifying creature in the sky. If a fish or a frog or a rat sees an eagle in the air, it knows its time is near. Because the moment it's flying with its with its wings out, <clears throat> it's there to attack. But when the eagle lowers its wings, it only lowers its wings in front of someone superior. Its parents, the leader of its tribe, the tribe of eagles, or another animal more superior, it will lower its wings and humble itself. This is the word Allah used to tell the Prophet wasallam, lower your wings. Lower your guard. Often when we are in certain situations, we have our guards up. We're performing. We're trying to be someone we're not. <clears throat> or we are scared of attack. We are on edge around certain people, certain environments. We're completely on edge, on guard about what we say and who we are, how we are speaking. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallam, when you're around the believers, the believers, Lower your wings, let down your guard, be soft with them, be gentle with them, be one with them. <clears throat> Every character trait that we talk about, whether it's humility, whether it's mercy, there are two extremes and there is a balance. And the Prophet ﷺ always hit right in the middle, the sweet spot. So if we look at humility, being humble, right, and being arrogant. So on one extreme, you have someone who's proud and arrogant. They think they are better than others. They compare themselves to others. They say, I, they think in the back of their mind, I have more wealth than this person. I have a higher status than this person. That shows in their behavior or in their speech or in their actions. This is arrogance and pride. In the middle, you have humility. Humility with self-respect. But on the other edge, the other extreme, you have the opposite. What is the opposite of pride? Not humility. If you go further down, yes, Samma. Lack of self esteem. Ya oh, Allah, ya yeah. Professor Ammar. Every time. Lack of self esteem. When you, find, you feel yourself so low, you lower yourself below your actual status, and you let people take advantage of you. Maybe you let people harm you. You. <clears throat> You lower yourself below the, the degree that you should. You go too far. The Prophet ﷺ says, لا ينبغي للمؤمني جزاكم الله خير يا مجتبى 
لا ينبغي للمؤمن أن يذل نفسه. A believer should not humiliate themselves. There's being humble, and then there's self-humiliation. And then on the other extreme, you have arrogance and pride. And we want to know how can we live the middle ground here. If we think about the humility of the Prophet ﷺ, we know that <clears throat> Israfil, who is Israfil? One of the children have to tell me, who is Israfil? Oh yeah, he's, yes, the angel. Anybody know what's Israfil's job? What's the job of Israfil? He, he blows the horn or he blows the trump. He blows the horn or he blows the trump for the, big, uh, the beginning of the Day of Judgment. This is Israfil's job. Israfil السلام, descends at the beginning of the Prophet's prophethood. And he says to the Prophet وسلم, you have two options. You can be a king prophet or you can be a servant prophet. What do you want to do? You have Dawood and Suleiman, kings. Not just prophets, kings. They had palaces, they had armies. Like this, they would change the direction of the wind. Dawood السلام, he holds metal and it just melts in his hands. You can be like that. Or you can be a servant prophet. What do you prefer? And the Prophet وسلم, says, I want to be a servant prophet. Don't make me a king prophet. This was from his character. That he always preferred humility. He wanted to be one with his people. <clears throat> and Israfil responds to him, Because you have chosen to humble yourself, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah will give you what you asked for. You will be a servant prophet, but, and this is the rule, this is the principle. The Prophet sallallahu says, Whoever humbles themselves for the sake of Allah, Allah will raise their rank. The Prophet chose consciously to be a servant prophet, so Allah gave him a gift from today, you are the Sayyidu Waladi Adam Yawm Al Qiyamah. You are going to be the master of all the children of Adam on the Day of Judgment. And you are Wa Awalu Man Tan Shakul Ardu Anhu Wa Awalu Shafih. You will be the first person to intercede on behalf of the believers. You will be the first person who will be resurrected. So you, are, Muhammad Sallallahu is the last messenger, but he will be the first of prophets. Why? Because he chose humility. That was his choice. How did the Prophet Sallallahu the humility and arrogance, these two opposite qualities? We can talk about humility and then we will talk about how to deal with pride and arrogance. Where does humility come from? Is it something you say? Is it something you, is it your body language? Or is it something in the heart? What do you say? You're saying both. You're saying it starts in the heart? <clears throat> and then it comes out in your actions. That's right. And that's the, tru that's the truth of every character trait we talk about. It starts in the heart, and then it expresses itself in the actions, depending on how deeply it is engraved in the heart. Now there's a problem, there's a reason we need to learn about humility. It's a very scary hadith. The Prophet wasallam says, لا يدخل الجنة A person will not enter paradise if they have an atom's weight of arrogance and pride in their heart. مَنْ كَانَ فِي قَلْبِهِ مِثْقَالُ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ خَرْدَلٍ مِنْ كِبْرٍ What does that mean for a believer? A Muslim will never be in the hellfire forever. But let's say you did all the five pillars. You went to Umrah, and you went to Hajj, and you were kind to your neighbor, and you did good to your parents. But you had a little bit of arrogance in your heart. You cannot enter paradise with that arrogance. It has to be removed from your system. If it is not removed by tests in this world, if it's not removed by the right company, it's not removed by fighting with your, yourself, it will be removed by the fire of Jahannam. So you can enter paradise. But we will not enter paradise without it. May Allah make us of those who enter paradise with no hisab. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. One thing that the Prophet ﷺ, if we just look at the body language of the Prophet, how does a king sit? How does a prime minister sit? Yeah? How does a king sit? Yeah? Head of the table? Yes? Elevated? Does a king, have you ever seen a king cross his legs? Never seen a king cross his legs? Okay. When you're in a car, 
Where does the politician sit? In the back seat. Yes. SubhanAllah, sometimes I try to go with some brothers in the car and they, please sit in the passenger seat. I said, no, the minister has to sit in the back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, so the ministers, they always sit in the back. Yeah. So they can stretch their legs and relax and then the driver's taking them. <clears throat> what is it in their mind that allows them to take that liberty, to take that luxury? Because they know their status compared to the status of the driver is different. In my native hometown of India, it's very common for a family to have a driver, to have servants, etc. But you'll never see the driver or the servants at the same table eating. You'll eat, the servants and the driver will be eating in the kitchen, the gardener. It's two separate lives. This is today, and these are Muslim families I'm talking about. And it's very important to realize that this is today. So somebody who's not a king, just a middle class average person, will have some servants working in the household or somebody driving the car or somebody doing the gardening and they will never sit on the same table to eat. We ask ourselves the question, why? There is something inside. They are different to me. I couldn't eat on the same table as them. Come on, me and them sharing from the same plate. What are you talking about? It's not possible. And if, we, <clears throat> if we look at our society, in Western society, there's definitely that feeling of class, that feeling of status. Certain people don't associate with certain people. We don't marry into those circles. No, no, we can't really go into those, you know, that person's from this postcode, no, yeah, I can't really, you know, we can't really associate ourselves. Oh, that masjid, you know, the, the AC isn't great, you know, the carpet's not that clean, I can't really pray in a dirty masjid like that. So people have this sense of, you know, I'm above something. The Prophet ﷺ, let's start with how did he sit? Where would the Prophet ﷺ sit when he was with his companions? <clears throat> When he was not teaching, he would sit amongst his companions on the floor as he was one of them. Such that somebody would enter the gathering and say, Ayyukum Muhammad, which one here is Muhammad? Because he wouldn't differentiate himself from amongst them. Except when he was teaching, they placed a mimbar or a place above the elevated place of the ground so that everybody could see who was teaching and could hear him. But other than that, he would sit with them. Now, how would the Prophet ﷺ sit? Specifically, how would he sit? I'm going to try and demonstrate for you. Anybody can show me how did the Prophet sit? Yes, show me. Just like this? You are close. Actually, brother, you are the closest. Before, what you were doing before was the closest. The Prophet Sallallahu let me move this table forward. MashaAllah, you can see my balancing skills. Uh, as the hadith mentions, the Prophet Sallallahu used to sit habwan or al ihtiba. Al ihtiba in Arabic is when someone pulls their knees to their chest and puts their arms around their knees, just like this brother is doing here puts the arms around their knees, sitting very casually. So I'm going to try and demonstrate for all of you. You know, like this. This is al ihtiba to sit habwa. Now when do people sit like this, brother, this young man there sitting like this? Yeah, you sit like this when you're relaxed. Yeah? You don't have any particular reason to, it's not, there's no formality. Yeah? This is how the Prophet ﷺ would sit most of the time. He would sit like this, habwa. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi authentic hadith, he says, when the Imam is giving the khutbah, you shouldn't sit like this. Why? Sitting like this is very casual. When the Imam is giving the khutbah, you should be sitting attentively. So most of the time he would sit like this on the floor. And how would he eat? Yes. He would eat with his hands, yeah, with three fingers. He would eat from the dish that was closest to him. And if he didn't like him, like something on the table, yeah, what would he say? Hmm? Yes. I know what to do, but hmm. like. Yeah, mashallah. Correct, yes. If he didn't like something on the table, if he didn't like something that was served, he wouldn't say anything. He wouldn't make a comment, where's the salt today? <laughs> he wouldn't say anything. And... Uh, he would just eat. This is from his humility. Not to embarrass the other person, not to make them feel anything. He would say, look, I'm the boss here. What kind of food is this without, without the perfect amount of spices and perfect amount of salt? Yes. At home, for example, we talked about in the car, the minister always sits in the back. The Prophet Sallallahu when he would ride a horse, a king is not accompanied on the horse. Yes. But the Prophet Sallallahu would always be accompanied when he was riding. He would sit someone behind him or in front of him. And this is how he won the hearts of people. 
not with his special aura and his prowess. He won the hearts of people with his softness and his closeness and his love and his humility. When Abdullah ibn Abbas, this young seven, eight-year-old boy, sits behind him, the Prophet ﷺ puts his arm around his shoulder. This is something from the humility of the Prophet is skin contact. He would always have skin contact with his companions. Let me give you an example. I want to teach you how to do the tashahud in salah towards the end of salah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. I can teach you sitting here, right? When the Prophet ﷺ wants to teach Mu'adh ibn Jabal the tashahud, he takes his hand in his hand and he shows him what to do with his hand. This level of softness and closeness and humility is the reason this man, Mu'adh, eventually becomes one of the greatest scholars of the Ummah. He was touched by the Prophet, not just physically, but also touched emotionally by the Prophet Sallallahu presence. There was a lot of customs and cultures at the time, primarily non-Arab, Persian, Roman. When the king would enter the room, what does everybody have to do? Stand up. I still remember my first day in the UK in university. The professor entered the room. I stood up. Good morning, sir. <laughs> all, my, all my colleagues were laughing at me. I realized here they called their professor by the first name. John! John? This is He's your friend or something. You call him Sir, Mr. Last name, professor, some respect, no, John, how's it going? <laughs> Sheikh, I can't do this. Yes. We, we, you know, we Indians, we, 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 we like hierarchy. We like our classes and systems and respect and sitting and standing. Yes. But what amazed me when I heard the first time that the Prophet ﷺ entered the room and his companions stood up and he told them, don't stand up, sit back down. He said, this is what the Romans and the Persians do. This is not what we do. When I enter the room, do not stand up. And if you want people to stand up for your entrance, you have a problem. Why, you think you're special? You're not special. Let them stay seated. You go down to them. This is how the Prophet ﷺ would be in his humility. He would go down to people. One day he was sitting. One of his companions said, look, why don't we give you a platform to eat? He was sharing from a plate with a slave, a slave in his household, a servant in his household, sharing from the same plate. Someone said, look, why don't you have your own plate and why don't you sit on a, you know, place that's raised? So he says, innama ana abd, me, me and this person are the same, we are both servants. I eat like a servant and I sit like a servant. This was the nature of the Prophet There's also a way in his body language. When he would walk, do you know how the Prophet ﷺ would walk? You can walk like this, yes? With your back stretched out and your nose up in the air. And uh, your physiotherapist will be very happy for the, your posture. How did the Prophet ﷺ walk? Anybody know? How did he walk? Yes? Not too fast, not too slow, that's from speed. But what about posture? Hmm? hmm? He would walk as though he's walking downhill. When you're walking downhill, your head is a little bit lowered, right? You're walking downhill. And also you'll be walking a bit faster than normal. He would walk a bit faster than normal and he would walk as though he's walking downhill. Lowered. When he enters Mecca, after 20 odd years of persecution from these people, he enters Mecca with his head bowed. He should have entered with his sword in the air, telling them, I'm here, I'm back for you. But he didn't. He enters with his head bowed. Why? The greatest humility is the humility you show to the people who don't deserve it from you. Everybody can be humble with their children, can be humble with their neighbor, humble with a shopkeeper. But the most difficult thing, that person you want to put in their place, somebody crosses you, somebody scams you, somebody... Uh, has a bad dealing with you and you want to show them don't try this again with me you want to humble them to show humility to this person is the biggest test when Allah subhanahu tests your ego somebody dents your ego you think you should have you could scratch me anywhere but you scratched me in my ego you're not I'm not going to let it fly 
you have two options. You can humiliate them, insult them, abuse them, embarrass them, put them in place, or you can treat them with humility, with gentleness. This was the nature of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How about how did the Prophet ﷺ react to praise when people would praise him? How would he react to praise? Of course, you know, in the Arab cultures, there's a very big culture of what's called mujamala, to exaggerate in the praise of somebody. And it comes from the, poet, the tradition of poetry. Kings would commission poetry in their praise. I'll pay you a thousand pounds, you write a nice poem. Praising Hisham. How would he sallallahu alayhi wa react to praise? Yes. That's right. He says one time, لا تطروني كما أطرت النصار ابن مريم Don't go, don't exaggerate in praising me like the Christians did with Jesus the son of Mary. Because this is human nature, by the way. It happens over time. It happens like over centuries. There's some righteous person. First you say, Fulan, this person, righteous person, praise Salah. Ten years later, maybe there's a frame of this person on the wall somewhere. I'm not endorsing that. I'm saying maybe somewhere there's a frame, there's a book. Someone says, this was a great saint and a wali of Allah. Leave another 20, 30 years. Someone comes, starts wiping the frame. Starts rubbing their clothes before they go out. Give it another 20, 30 years, people start making dua to the frame. This righteous person. This is, this is how the cycle begins. I'm from a part of the world where there are certain saints, people who are assumed to be awliya. They have graves. And I know people by name who will not make dua to Allah. They will only make dua to this person in the grave. I know I'm from this part of the world. They will enter the grave, they'll make dua, they will walk backwards because they don't want to turn their back to the person who has passed away in the grave. They will walk backwards like this. Where did it begin? It all began with exaggerating the praise of this person. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says to his companions, do not do what those before you did. masajid. They made the graves of their prophets as places of worship, as objects of worship. So you have this. He says to his companions, don't praise me like the Christians praised Jesus, son of Mary. Don't go overboard because over time, don't make me a God like they made him a God. That's dangerous. Don't do that. I am not Allah. I am lesser. What you should say, say, Abdullahi wa rasuluh. Allah's messenger and his slave know who I am. One of the beauty of the Prophet Sallallahu humility. I'll ask you this question. What is the greatest honor of the Prophet in the Quran? How did Allah honor the Prophet? The greatest honor he gave him in the Quran is a name. A name he called the Prophet in the Quran, the greatest honor for him. The biggest gold medal for him. Which surah did he say that? Sorry? No, not Surah Muhammad. <coughs> Surah Al Isra, give me the ayah. First ayah. Go on. Give me the. Go on. Subhanalladi Asra bi abadihi laylam min al masjid al harami il al masjid al aqsa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free the people of Masjid al aqsa. Allah says in the beginning of the surah, Glory be to the one. Who took his slave, Asra bi Abdi. He didn't say he took his prophet. He didn't say he took his messenger. He didn't say he took the greatest man to walk on this earth. He said, I took my slave. But this was the greatest honor for the Prophet. To be associated with Allah is enough for me as an honor. This is humility. In order to worship the worship of Allah, the reverence of Allah. Ultimately, it comes down to humbling ourselves in front of Allah. How would the Prophet ﷺ show his humility at home? One of the signs, many scholars they say, one of the signs of arrogance at home, particularly for a man, is that a man won't lift his finger at home to help anywhere in the house. This is a sign of pride and arrogance, according to Ibn Qudama in the 7th century. So don't say I'm a feminist. Ibn Qudama said it, you can blame him, inshallah. Leave, leave me alone. 
Okay. Because <clears throat> we have people today, they say, if I have to lift my finger, then you have to pay part of the rent. They say this to their wives. They think this is the peak of masculinity. Obviously, we should invite them to attend these classes so they can learn what masculinity is. The Prophet ﷺ, what would he do at home? كَانَ يَفْلِي ثَوْبَهُ وَيَحْلِبُ شَاتَهُ He would milk he would milk the animals in his backyard. He would repair his own clothes, his own buttons. يَرْقَعُ ثَوْبَهُ Hanging, drying, cleaning his clothes. يَخْصِفُ نَعْلَهُ If there was something in his sandals, he would lace his sandals, he would repair his sandals. His honorable hand was touching his shoes. You might say, I'm such a you know, I've reached a certain status in society. If I want to polish my shoes, I have to stick them out and somebody can polish them for me. But he would polish his own sandals. وَيَأْكُلُ مَعَ الْخَادِمِ If his servant was eating, he would sit and eat with them. He would tie the camel. He would do, you know, we say this in English, DIY, do it yourself. He would do as many things as possible himself. People would run to do it for him. Let me do this for you. Let me, let me milk. You don't, you don't sit down. No, please, don't touch your shoes. No, I will do it myself. As a matter of fact, one time, the Prophet ﷺ went to the market. And he bought sarawil. What is a sirwal? Or do we call it shal shalwar? Shalwar. Which is what? Trousers. Yes. Yeah, the lower garment, but they are more like trousers, loose trousers. One day the Prophet ﷺ goes to the market. Of course, all the Pakistanis will get happy. The Prophet ﷺ wore shalwar kameez. Relax. Hold, hold on a second. <laughs> relax, guys. Okay, relax. The majority of scholars say he bought the sirwal, but he didn't wear it. <laughs> Inshallah, next time. <laughs> Abu Huraira who narrates the Prophet ﷺ entered the market with Abu Huraira. Okay, so he has Abu Huraira with him. Now tell me something. Was Abu Huraira anhu, older than the Prophet Sallallahu or younger than him? Older. Keep this in mind as we tell the tale. He enters the market with Abu Huraira and he buys some loose trousers. And he says to the person who's weighing the text, the cloth, he's saying, Zin wa arjih, weigh it properly, you know, weigh it balanced, take your right. <clears throat> As he says to this person, weigh it properly, the person selling the trousers tries to grab his hand to kiss his hand. The Prophet ﷺ pulls his hand. He says, this is what the Romans do with their kings. You don't do this with me. Walas to be malik, I'm not a king. Innama ana rajulu minkum, I'm just like one of you. Look at the humility. Is the Prophet ﷺ like one of us? Is it the same as us? What's the difference between us and the Prophet ﷺ? In the end of Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ I'm just a man like you, but there's a difference. يُحَا إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدًا But I receive wahi from Allah. There is a light in me that you don't have. As a side benefit, there is a hadith, its authenticity is disputed, but its meaning is correct. The Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, the person who has the Qur'an in their heart, قَدْ حَوَى النُّبُوَّةَ بَيْنَ جَنْبَيْهِ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ لَا يُحَى إِلَيْهِ It is like this person is like a prophet because the revelation is in their heart. Except one difference, Allah doesn't reveal anything new to them. Allahu Akbar. So if you are a person who holds the Qur'an in your heart, this is what specialized the Prophet ﷺ from the rest of creation, revelation. The Prophet ﷺ, he's trying to buy and someone grabbed his hand to kiss his hand. He pulled his hand away. Don't, don't treat me like the Persians and the Romans treat their king. I am just one of you. And he takes his trousers and he leaves. Abu Huraira and who comes to grab the trousers from him. Let me hold it for you. And he says, صَاحِبُ الشَّيْءِ أَحَقُّ بِشَيْئِهِ أَنْ يَحْمِلَهِ The person who owns the trousers should hold them, not you. Walk next to me if you want, but don't hold my trousers. I'll hold it myself. He would hold his own trousers. Bargain by himself. Pick his own... Do things by himself. Why? 
to keep that humility. Because the farther and farther away, the less your hands are rough, and the less you are used to rolling up your sleeves, the more pride and arrogance and status that creates within your life. It's something I have noticed. There are many cultures around the world, maybe not as much in the UK, because the UK tends to be a very DIY, do-it-yourself culture. People will, they will cement their own slabs and they will mow their own lawns and they will do everything, they will even change their own tires. In the vast majority of Muslim countries, there is, a, there is a culture of having people do this for you. Having servants, having drivers, having gardeners. Something I've noticed over time is that this kills, this kills the ability for a person to do hard work. If a person grows up with all these people doing everything for them. They grow up and they are unable to lift a finger. We actually destroy our own children by making things easy for them. Now, this is a saying. Someone said it to me a few weeks ago, and I wish I had mentioned it. They said, tough times make tough men, and women as well. And tough men make easy times. And easy times make easy men. And easy men make tough times. And tough times make tough men. And the cycle repeats itself. Every generation... Many people who, who, who migrated to the UK, they had a tough time just surviving, building the first masjid, getting halal meat, just scraping the bottom of the pan for a job. So they want their children to have an easy time. Don't lift a finger, my child. Don't fold the clothes. Forget about the washing. Don't worry about the garden. Relax. I got everything sorted for you. Thinking, I had it hard. Let me make it easy for them. This child grows up and they're so incompetent. They're so incompetent, they can't even lift a finger to do their own day-to-day -day chores. So they cause a mess. They cause hard times for themselves. So the children, their children, the next generation say, look, <coughs> our parents had it so easy. They made life hard for us. We have to work hard. And so the cycle repeats itself. The Prophet ﷺ, his habit, his humility, as much as possible, he would try to do everything himself. As much as possible. As much as reasonable. Of course, there's an exception. When would he get somebody else to do something for him? You guys went to sleep. I didn't ask you a question. The Prophet ﷺ most of the time would do everything by himself, but sometimes he would get people to do something for him. Hmm. When he's sick, <clears throat> are you saying when it benefits the person? That's one. Let's take the sick example. Why does, why does the Prophet ﷺ, or why does a Muslim need somebody else to treat them? Why do you go to the doctor? More specifically, yes? To get better. Okay, why don't you do it yourself? I need a better answer. Huh? Okay, the nerves, okay. They're more qualified. They know something that you don't. One day the Prophet ﷺ is asked a question about agriculture. And he says, Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum. You guys know better about your dunya affairs. This specialist knowledge is not something that Allah gave me. So let's say you, tr you try to do some mechanical work on your own. And what happens to the car? Car never moves again. <laughs> you should have hired this specialist. <laughs> Yes. So the Prophet ﷺ, he outsources, he gets someone to do it when it's something that he himself, وسلم, it's not within his area of expertise. And then he chooses the right person to do it. He delegates to the right person. And this was from the beauty of his leadership. When the Prophet ﷺ would be invited, <clears throat> when he would be invited for a meal, he would never say no. Sometimes people who would invite him, they would not have something to feed him except bread and some gravy. That's it. And we know that the Arabs, when they host, feast means laham. There has to be some meat involved. But if somebody hosted him and they had a very humble setup, that would not be a reason for him not to go. He would go. He would honor them by honoring their invitation. When the Prophet ﷺ goes for Hajj, now Hajj is a tiring and a tough journey. Don't you think he deserves the finest camel, the finest horse in all of Medina? 
But what he gets instead is a very cheap animal with a very rough bridle for him to sit, a very rough seat for him to sit on that was worth four dirhams. But the whole journey of Hajj, not for one second does he complain about the quality of his seat or the speed of his animal. All he does is he says, Allahumma ja'alhu hajjan mabrura. Oh Allah, make this an accepted hajj. Today you go on Umrah. From day one till the day you come back, you will not stop hearing complaints about the flight, the airline, the food on the airline, the salt in the food on the airline. The air hostess didn't smile at me. Babi Abasha. The AC, the AC you know, wasn't cool enough. The AC was too cool. Okay. Yes. The, the hotel distance to the Haram was not seven minutes. It was nine minutes. I called for towels. It came three minutes late. The whole journey. You could go in the best package in the world. You will hear this the whole journey. You will hear people cursing the operators, cursing the hotels in Medina Tul Munawwara until the day you return. And this messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, from his humility, he did hajj on a non-ideal animal, on a cheap seat. Huh? <laughs> yes, uncle has a fair point, he didn't pay the money. <laughs> so, yeah. If it is your haqq, you paid for something and you advertise something, you have a right. But some people, they complain more than their right, more than what they had gotten and more than, that, more than what was required. And the whole journey just becomes a matter of complaint. <clears throat> At some point in time in Medina, because of the interaction with Jews and Christians, one thing about the Judeo-Christian scriptures is that over time, they tainted the image of their messengers. They said that Yunus السلام, committed a sin. They mentioned that some prophets or some messengers, Dawood, Sulaiman, etc., that they killed, that they <coughs> were wrongful to their spouses, that they did some corruption and some wrong. Some things that are unbecoming of prophets. And so there was this, this feeling that the Prophet ﷺ is greater than the other prophets. And it was mentioned to him one day. So the Prophet ﷺ says, لا تفضلوني على يونس بن متى. He says, don't think that I am better than my brother Yunus. ولا تفضلوا بين الأنبياء. And don't say that these prophets are better than those prophets. ولا تخيروني على موسى. And don't say that I was greater than Musa. وَنَحْنُ أَحَقُّ بِشَكِّ مِنْ إِبْرَاهِيمِ And we, should, we, are more, we are more in need of questioning than Ibrahim. Because Ibrahim asked Allah, O oh Allah, show me how you resurrect the dead. وَلَوْ لَبِثْتُ مَا لَبِثَ يُوسُفُ فِي السِّجْنِ لَأَجَبْتُ الدَّاعِ And maybe if I had stayed in prison as long as Yusuf, maybe I would have given up. But Yusuf was better than me. Why does he say this? We know he is the greatest of all prophets. But part of humility is downplaying your status. Because people will always praise. People will always say things about you. But to downplay your status, no, 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 that's not me. Of course, there is something called fake humility. When you insult yourself in front of people so they can praise you. You do it excessively. Subhanallah, I am just a poor miskeen. Who am I to teach you? No, Sheikh, you are the most knowledgeable man on the planet. No, no, please, 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 don't say this. Please don't say this. No, please don't pick up my bags and my shoes. No, no, I don't need, I don't need more gifts from you. No, please don't buy me more clothes. No, no, please, I'm just... So this fake humility, this is not required. Allah knows what is in the heart. The Prophet ﷺ's humility is genuine. He really believes he is not the greatest of prophets. He really believes the other prophets are better than him. One person comes to him one day, he says, Ya Khair al Bariya, oh the best of creation. He says, Daka Ibrahim, that's Ibrahim, not me. Ibrahim alayhi salam. In the Prophet ﷺ's interaction with people, a king, someone who sees themselves as better than others, greater than others, there will be times. When they think, look, I don't have time for this. This is not, it's not my place to deal with this. A lit, Prophet ﷺ is walking in Medina. A little girl grabs his hand. Let go of my hand. Bint al-Halal. I'm the king of this city. I'm the boss. I have wives to manage. I have an army to manage. I have all this stuff. I can't, I can't be playing with you in the streets. 
She grabs his hand, doesn't say a word. Wherever she runs, he just follows her in the streets of Medina until she lets go of his hand. When he comes across this man, the Prophet Sallallahu practice when he would pass by an orphan is what would he do? He would rub the head of the orphan and bring them close, give them a hug. One man sees him doing this. He says, I have 10 children. I don't do this with any of them. Masculinity. Masculinity. The Prophet Sallallahu says, Laysa minna, you are not from us. If you don't have mercy for the young and respect for the old. This is part of humility. Part of humility. One day a man came to the, in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu and he had like a seizure. <clears throat> you know sometimes some celebrities, their fans are so crazily in awe by them, people faint. Yeah, they see their celebrity come, this famous singer or this famous actor or whatever, or actress. And just because this person is like one meter from them, the person, people faint because of the awe, sense of awe and amazement. So one day a man comes in the presence of the Prophet and he's shaking. The Prophet says, Hawun alayk, relax. For inni less to be malik, I'm not a king. You don't have to, you don't have to tremble in front of me, relax. I'm just a son of a lady from Quraysh, from your own people who used to eat Qadid, the type of food. Relax. I'm just one of you. We're the same. This was the nature of the Prophet ﷺ. One of the scariest things about arrogance, according to Ibn Qudama, he says the people who are struck with the most pride, they don't know it. It's the religious people, the worshippers, the scholars, the students of knowledge. They don't realize it and they have a sense of pride in their heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. How do we remove this pride from our hearts? Where does pride come from? Tell me, where does pride come from? Where, is, I'm, where does arrogance come from? <coughs> it comes from our self first. The shaitan can only enhance it. He can only make it worse. <clears throat> it comes from the feeling that you are doing something. Power. Mm -hmm. Yes, Amma. They think they can do anything, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, righteousness. It comes from righteousness. But across all of these, you have an arrogant businessman. You have a proud politician. You have a proud scholar. What's in common across all of these people? Yes, Rizma. Self-amazement, that's a step one, to feel amazed at a quality that they have. Yes, brother, you had your hand up. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The same as what he said. A feeling of a sense of self-achievement. I have achieved something. Yes. Feeling higher than other people. Yes. Okay, you work hard to get something. Yes, rags to riches, so you think now. I'm, I'm the guy Feeling proud The root cause of pride and arrogance Is you have a good quality Maybe you have wealth Maybe you have intelligence Maybe you have knowledge Maybe you have a good business Maybe you're handsome Maybe you're beautiful Any good quality That you see That this is one of the One of the excellent qualities That a human being can have And I have it That's step one is that a bad thing for me to be beautiful, for me to be intelligent, wealthy? It's not a bad thing. Second, how I feel about this quality. How do I feel about my wealth? Do I feel I made it? I'm a self-made man. Or do I feel it was gifted to me? How do I feel about my beauty? Do I feel I've beautified myself or it was gifted to me? 
How do I feel about my knowledge? This is the dangerous one. How do I feel about my worship? This is the dangerous one. I did it or was it gifted to me? And then there's the third step, which is comparison with others. You can be self-amazed and you're the only person on this earth. But you can't be arrogant unless you're comparing to somebody else. I have this nice jacket. I worked hard. I went, I saw all these guys buying their Moroccan jackets. I said, I'll get a Libyan one. Yeah, why? I'm different to them. Yeah, better than them. I'm not going to go with the trend. You know, I'll go my direction, they can go theirs. Yeah, so I buy my jacket. And then I see, I see them and I see me. I think it's, of course, this is much more refined. Yeah, of course. It comparison. Without comparison, you don't have pride. You're in a job. You get promoted. You go from you know, engineer to senior engineer. Doctor to consultant. Bricklayer to director of bricklaying. And suddenly you look at the other guy. You're having lunch one day with your colleague. And maybe he blurts out his salary. You realize, huh? He's lower than me. And he's earning more than me. That night you can't sleep because somebody dented your ego. The next time I sit in the meeting, I'm going to make sure to humiliate this guy. He better, not, he better not think he's more than me. I'll show him that he's junior and I'm the senior. I'll put him in his place. It all comes from comparison. We live today in the world of comparison. You want to buy insurance? You go on comparison website. You want to, go, you want to buy slippers? You'll go and compare 16 different deals. You cannot live your life without comparing it to somebody else's life because people's lives are in your face on social media. So this... This pride or this arrogance or this feeling that I'm better, I'm different than other people, it's been magnified today because of comparison. Because we live on that comparison. So I have a quality. I have to see that quality as something I produced and then I have to compare myself with others and see that I am greater than them. Now I have arrogance. These three steps. How do I get rid of my arrogance? How do I humble myself? The first is take a picture of the Prophet's life and try to emulate it. How you sit, how you stand, how you interact. The greatest sign of humility is how you interact with the people less than you. This is the greatest sign of humility. How you interact with children, how you interact with a worker in your household, how you interact with people who are younger than you, people who have less than you, less wealth than you, poor, people who have less power than you. This is the sign of humility, being humble. Everybody can be humble to their teacher or their sheikh or their father or their king or their queen. Everybody will be humble to someone greater. But who is going to be humble for somebody less than them? Who will serve the person less than them? You're a teacher in a classroom and your students are rowdy, you're trying to manage the classroom, they're troubling you, they're annoying you. But one particular student, you feel that something must be wrong in, the, in their life because they're always playing up. Something, something deeper is there. So you take them aside. Everything okay. What's going on? Student says, look, my father drinks alcohol. My mother, my parents are divorced. You know, what kind of a household life I have. I come to the masjid, I just want to scream and have fun and shout at all of my colleagues and trouble in the classroom. And in this moment, rather than the ego of the teacher coming in and saying, listen, I don't care your background, detention. The humility takes over and you say, don't worry, it's okay. I'm here to help you, but we have to work together. You're, you have a business and you have some people who are employed by you. And one day someone employed by you, you know, they drop something. It, it shatters tsh, on the floor. You have two options. You can go to them and get rid of them straight away. Why? Because they humiliated me in my business. They have lowered the customer standards. In this. Or you can go say, look, you made a mistake. Don't do it again. Pick up the glass with them. Servant leadership. This was the way of the Prophet ﷺ. If somebody's digging a trench, he is the first one to hold the spade. If somebody's in battle, he is the first in line. If a cow needs to be milked at home, he is the first one with his hands deep in the bucket. He is the first to get his hands dirty. It's part of humility. When Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants to teach us humility in the Quran, there's one particular way Allah Subhanahu wa Taala teaches us humility. He reminds us of something specific. Not parents. 
Sorry? Not the orphan. This, huh? what you were created from. Who can tell me from Surah Abasa? When Allah reminds a human being what he's created of. Allah says, human being, when you get too arrogant, don't forget where you came from. You were a drop of semen that came from somebody else's private part. Akramakumullah. This, this was you. <coughs> you were nothing. Whatever you gained of beauty, of wealth, of power, of status, that drop of semen didn't do it. That's really you. That didn't do it. I granted this for you. Humble yourself to me. Allah reminds us in the end of Surah Yasin. Who can remember, remind, remember the ayah? Where are my Hufad today? فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسِيَ خَلْقَهَا Allah says, I created this human being from a drop. They grow up and now they're argumentative and arrogant. Ha. And they give me an analogy and they forget the way they were created. قَالَ مَنْ يُحْيِي الْعِظَامَ وَهِيَ رَمِيمٌ Who is going to revive the dead when we are bones? قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ Tell him, the one who created you from scratch can do it again. وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمٍ And he is deeply knowledgeable about every creation. You were nothing. If you became something, remember that you were nothing. And that you will return to nothing again. This is the root reminder you need to deal with that pride, to deal with that arrogance. I am nothing, I am a nobody. This is the root. And the second, <clears throat> especially for those who are practicing, as they say, religious. How do you prevent religious arrogance? The pride of the religious. That feeling that I am I'm somebody, I'm a worshipper, I'm pious, I'm righteous. How do you prevent that feeling from entering your heart? There's two ways. The first is to remember the time before you were righteous. Before you knew Allah. Before you knew Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa There was a time before that. There was a transition. Allah guided you to that transition. You, he can return you back. So don't think it was you. It was somebody else. It was someone else. The first. To credit Allah rather than crediting yourself. And the second is to realize whatever I do, it's not enough. To feel ashamed of the good that you are doing. That it's not enough. Allah describes this mindset in the Quran. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْا People who present worship to Allah وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةٌ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ But their hearts are feeling scared. They are trembling. Will Allah accept this from me or not? Will Allah accept our worship? Will Allah accept our recitation of the Qur'an? Will Allah accept our fasting? Did we do it for the right reasons? Did we consider in that moment that we did this for Allah? Did we want to please people? Did we want to please ourselves? Did we enjoy people looking at us and praising us? Did we think that we're special? Did we think it was from ourselves? Will Allah accept it? We don't know. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts one-tenth of my prayer, I'm happy. One-tenth. What's left? What will be left of our deeds? We have to remember this. This will humble us and remind us all good comes from Allah. All mistakes come from ourselves and the shaitan. And I will end with the hadith that I began with. We will not be given entrance into paradise if we have a mustard seed of arrogance in our heart. May Allah purify our hearts of arrogance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us humility and humbleness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to improve 
allow us to have fear of him in our hearts and humility. <clears throat> and we still have about 40 minutes till Isha. I'm going to open the floor for question and answers, inshallah, once this light turns off. وَصَلِ اللَّهُمَّ وَسَلِّمُ بَارِكَ عَلَى نَبِيْنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعٍ